about you, but I am really glad that the year 2020 is now behind us. As I reflected on this past year, I look forward to this new year with great hope and great expectation. For I know that the year 2021 is going to be our year. That I know that we'll be more intentional about being connected, but we'll also be more committed to living out the mission of the church like never before. So as a way of starting this new year together in this worship experience, I lean back to the traditions of the founder of the Methodist movement. In 1775, John Wesley introduced the covenant service as an important part of the spiritual renewal for the Methodist societies. This service was an opportunity for Methodists to gather annually for a time of self-examination, reflection, dedication, commitment, and to renew their covenant with God. According to Wesley's journal, by the end of his life, he would make sure that this service was always held the first Sunday of the new year. And since then, for generations, churches throughout the world, they've used this model of worship as a way of refocusing and realigning with the mission of love and power through Christ Jesus. As a part of this covenant service, Wesley composed a prayer that we find in our hymnals and we find in our book of worship. And it starts with this line, I am no longer my own, but thine. Over the years, Wesley's prayer has undergone revision and adaptations, but it's still a radical declaration of love and commitment. This morning, I want us to pray that prayer together. I found a more modern version of this prayer that a United Methodist pastor in Seattle, Washington wrote a few years ago named Reverend Jeremy Smith. Will you join me in this prayer? I am not my own self-made, self-reliant human being. In truth, O God, I am yours. Make me into what you will. Make me a neighbor with those whom you will. Guide me on the easy path for you. Guide me on the rocky road for you. Whether I am to step up for you or step aside for you. Whether I am to be lifted high for you or brought low for you. Whether I become full or empty with all things or with nothing. I give all that I have and all that I am for you. So be it. And may I always remember that you, O oh God, and I belong to each other. Amen. You know, when we're immersed in the love and grace of God, an interesting thing happens. We all of a sudden get to the point where we don't have to do everything because we have a God who can do amazing things. And when we become weak, He makes us strong. When we become captives, we're set free. Please stand and join us.
The lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, the first chapter, verses 6 through 8 and 19 through 28. Listen for the word of the Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place at Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Prepare, prepare for the coming of the Lord in the desert. Prepare, O oh Lord. Every valley shall be lifted up, each mountain and hill made low. Good morning and welcome. I tell you, you know, things are very difficult for us in these days as we continue to uh, meet online and not face to face and not enjoying the love and the life of community together. But we believe this is uh, a necessary thing for us right now. You know, when Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your strength. And, you know, He he then added something. He said, love your neighbor as yourself as a part of that great commandment. You know, we have a tremendous number of people who are dealing with very serious illness. And uh, you know, we remain committed to keeping as safe an environment as we possibly can. And so we urge you to continue to watch your emails and Facebook as uh, we find our way through and be patient with us 
uh, as this is so incredibly serious. Again, I want to welcome you this morning. You know, we're at the second Sunday after Christmas. And that seems a little strange to some of us as, you know, Christmas has come and gone. You know, the gifts have been unwrapped and put away and all the decorations for the most part. But you know, it doesn't, Christmas doesn't end, the season officially doesn't end until Epiphany, which is January 6th. And so, you know, today we're in the Christmas season, but yet this is Epiphany Sunday in the uh, Christian calendar as we approach January 6th. So we celebrate the birth of the Christ child, but we also commemorate the coming of the Magi, and we also commemorate the numerous ways in which God makes Himself known and reveals Himself to us in the ordinariness of life. And so we're in betwixt and between. But today we're going to celebrate you know, birth of, both the birth of Christ and, you know, that incarnation, and we're also going to uh, be mindful of the ways in which Christ is made known to us now. And so, as we move along in our service, I would ask you to join me in prayer. Lord of bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus your Son, a new way to live. You've poured your light into the world. You've asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt and despair. You promised to be our light all the days of our lives and ask us to place our trust in you. Now the journey into this life is risky. It means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you, giving you our best and offering hope and light to others. And in this new year, we bring to you the names and situations of others for whom light seems to be a stranger. They struggle with ill health and economic hardship, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones and anxiety. We place them in your care. So, Lord Jesus Christ, let your light shine on them, bringing healing and hope, and help us to be bearers of the light in all that we do. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, at this point in our regular in-person worship services, uh, we would be preparing to receive our morning tithes and offerings. And so I would encourage you in these moments to um, think about how you would give expression to your generosity toward the church and to fulfilling you know, your commitment and vow to, um, to support the life of the church and community. And so... As you do that, I would also ask that you prepare to receive Holy Communion. Um, we will symbolically be uh, participating and receiving the sacrament this morning. And if you have juice or crackers or water at home, we invite you to participate as we will offer the words of consecration. But now let's turn to the Gospel. I will turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then verses 19 through 28. And as we begin, I would, I would invite you to imagine John the Baptist baptizing in the River Jordan. And the Jews send priests and Levites from Jerusalem 
to demand who He is and why He's doing what He's doing. And John's response begins with a very open disclosure. He says, I am not the Messiah. And so they press him a bit harder and ask, are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. So if you're not one of these famous religious um, personages, who do you think you are and what right do you have and how do you dare and who gave you the authority to baptize? If you're not a famous figure, why are you doing what you're doing? Well, John the Baptist deflects the question from himself to someone else. That is, after all, his role he says, in effect, I'm baptizing because among you stands one you do not even know. And everything I do serves to point you in the direction of Him who is present right next to you, but unrecognized by you. You know, John the Baptist is clear that he is not the main attraction here. He's just the opening act. We have lots of ways of describing people who really serve to facilitate the accomplishments of others. They're sometimes used in a way that makes them appear unimportant. The public accomplishments of many are not possible without the behind-the-scenes work of talented and committed people. You know, I think about speechwriters. And as long as no one mistakes John for Jesus, John the Baptist doesn't care whether he's appreciated or not, because he's very clear that he's here to do his job. And his job is to constantly remind those around him of the presence of the one who stands among them that they do not know. You see, the lack of recognition of Jesus is a prominent theme in John's Gospel. You know, in those first 18 verses of John's Gospel, he says that Jesus was in the world. And the world came into being through Him. And yet, the world did not know Him. In several instances, Jesus stands next to people in the Gospel, offering them healing and life, and yet they fail to recognize Him. I think about Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and Jesus offers him the chance to be spiritually recreated and reborn. And Nicodemus you know, babbles on about climbing back into the womb, not understanding. And I hear the words of the Gospel writer ring out again. Among you stands one whom you do not know. Or in chapter 4, the woman of Samaria. She comes to the well to find Jesus sitting there waiting for her. And He offers her there living water. And she, on the other hand, talks about how deep the well is and how she has no bucket to fetch the water. And we hear the words of the Gospel ring out. Among you stands one whom you do not know. Or in chapter 5, Jesus stands beside a man who had been ill for 38 years and became somewhat comfortable in his daily routine of misery. And as Jesus offers him wholeness, saying, do you want to be made well? The man indicates that he would love to be healed, but 
He hadn't been able to work out the timing to enter into the bubbling water quite yet. And the Gospel rings out, Among you stands one whom you do not know. In chapter 8, Jesus stands on the edges of a crowd who are gathered to stone a woman caught in adultery. And He shames her accusers into dropping their stones and slinking away. And afterward, the Pharisees question His message and His authority to judge or not judge. And Jesus replies, You know neither Me nor My Father. If you knew Me, you would know My Father also. Once again, we hear an echo of John 1, 26. Among you stands one whom you do not know. After Jesus heals a man born blind over in chapter 9 of John's Gospel, Jesus' uh, opponents try to put the man on the defensive, demanding to know the identity of the one who had healed him. As for this man, we do not know where he comes from, they say. And the formerly blind man replies, you know, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from. And yet, He opened my eyes. Among you stands one whom you do not know. Says Jesus as He boldly faces Judas and His soon-to-be captors, He identifies Himself, saying, I am He. And Jesus stands next to Mary in the garden, She turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. But she recognizes Him when He calls her name. Her response is to tell the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Jesus stands in the midst of shocked disciples in a locked room in chapter 20. And then He stands on the beach just after daybreak offering advice to His disciples on how to land a huge haul of fish in chapter 21. Now there's so many times in the Gospel of John we see the examples of the fact that among us stands one whom we do not know. And that one offers us new birth and healing, forgiveness, living water, new life, spiritual sight, A way to God and a way out of captivity to unbelief and into resurrection faith. You see, John's purpose in writing this Gospel is that we may believe in Jesus. And believing, we may have life in His name. Whoever believes in Me Believes not in me, he says, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. Friends, as daily walking Christians, our role is not unlike that of John the Baptist. We're to point to people of the truth. And we're to point to the fact that among us stands one whom we do not know. You know, through the spoken word here, word proclaimed is not the only way that we come to recognize that one who stands among us that we do not know. But we learn to recognize Him as we share our lives and our stories in community. 
And as we share our stories of what we know from our own experience of our encounters with Jesus, you know, that is our witness and that is our role. You know, we're not the light, but we sure can reflect it. We have another opportunity to come to know Him today in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You know, a very holy time when we come together not only to remember what Christ has done in us and for us, but to remember that He is here with us now and present. That somehow in the mystery of faith, He is here to claim and to affirm us and to empower us by the indwelling of His person as we symbolize that with the taking on of the bread and the wine. And so we invite all of you to participate this morning. And we hope that you do experience the presence of Jesus in a powerful way. So would you join me in a very brief prayer of consecration this morning? Let us pray. Oh Lord, we remember how on the night in which You gave Yourself up for us, You took the bread and broke it and gave it to His disciples and said, take and eat. This is My body broken for you. And we remember how after, he supper, after the supper, He took the cup and gave thanks to You and gave it to His disciples saying, drink from this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall in remembrance of me. And so, O Lord, we pause in these holy moments and ask that you would move us beyond memory, and that you would help us to experience in these moments the reality of You pouring out Your Holy Spirit upon us gathered together and upon these gifts of bread and wine and that You would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be the body of Christ broken for the world. Make us one with each other and one with You and one with ourselves as whole and integrated disciples of Jesus. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And the body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, bind us together as your church by the power of your Spirit and empower us in our service to the Christ and bless us as we offer our love and devotion and as we receive the incredible love that he holds for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with peace.